Hello, a very good evening to you from Dartford's Orchard Theatre. Well, these John Bull Bitter London Pool Championships got off to a tremendous start last week when the East Londoner Steve Sanders won an 11-frame thriller against Rob McKenna, the Welsh champion. And Steve will obviously be more interested than anybody else in tonight's match because he's going to play the winner in the semi-finals. Now, what a contrast we have here tonight. There's big Charlie Nolan, 42-year-old Dubliner. He now lives in Hornsey. He's a London transport bus inspector, and I believe you shoot pool regulars will know by now, Charlie is a very difficult man to beat. I think even he might admit he tends to do things very much at his own pace. Unlike Ross McInnes, nicknamed the Flying Scotsman from Glasgow, he's the world speed pool record holder and has a host of other titles to his name as well. well let's have a word with Ross. Ross, your, your first appearance in these championships, you've got a lot of other titles I know. How keen are you to win here? Oh, I'm very keen to win here. I'm really looking forward to playing Charlie and uh, then Steve and then uh, probably Joe Barbara. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, the hair against the tortoise, we feel it might be. What do you think about that? That's true. Uh, well, Charlie's nickname is the tortoise, but I think a tortoise is a, a wee bit too fast for Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're saying one or two pretty controversial things already that might not endear you to the crowd here, but uh, you enjoy it when the crowd doesn't like you. That's correct. Uh, I think it, uh, when I'm down, most of the points I play, I'm usually favourite to beat them and uh, the crowd then goes on his side, you know, and I, I found out that when the crowd's on the other, uh, other guy's side, it, it spurs me on to win, and uh, I hope they'll all be cheering on Charlie today. So the man they love to hate, then? Yes, yes, you can say that. OK, well, Ross, I know it's, you're going to break here tonight and uh, look forward to it, cos you've already put yourself under a fair amount of pressure, haven't you? Yes, I do it all the time. <laughs> OK, Ross, thanks very much indeed. Well, your commentators, as always, for this 11-frame uh, quarter-final, Steve Clark and Chris Carter. And, Ross, off you go. <laughs> First frame, break. Ross McInnes makes the break in what will undoubtedly be a different clash of styles and temperament. Open table. Charlie Nolan doesn't rush, and he'll be happy to play a tactical game for as long as necessary. Charlie would have Open preferred table. to have been on yellows there, but not an easy possible chance available for his first shot, so playing a safety stroke. Ross just seeing if he can get past the black to the yellow over the top left. Played a plant there, and shot, he decided to play the reds. Red, red One goes into the bottom right. And He's those reds are nice and open. Yes, he's got the one into the centre pocket now, Chris. All the reds are certainly potable. The black is in the open as well. So there could be a chance for clearance here. He's not too happy with that shot. He's ended up dead straight onto the red into the bottom left. He wanted to play that one and then the one over the pocket, but maybe forced to play the one into the top right now, followed by the one into the top left. Well, not a good shot, and Ross will be disappointed, to say the least, about that. <coughs> but early days. And the way Charlie Nolan plays, days could be the operative word. Well, they say that the leopard doesn't change his spots, but perhaps Charles Nolan was bluffing when he spoke to us earlier. Well, I'm getting older now, so I'm really slowing up, you know. And, uh, of course, Ross has got this name of being the flying Scotsman, so... I don't think he'll be flying by the end of, end of the competition. Will it be a deliberate policy for you to slow him down then? Definitely, yes. At least five minutes is shot, if I'm allowed. Just, I think you've played him before, though. Tell us about that game. I don't remember how much he was so fast. You know, nobody could really catch him, and you probably won't be able to catch him on camera. You think I'm playing on my own here today.
Well, he elected to play the one in the top left. It wouldn't pass the other yellow, which is over the pocket, and that could be a costly shot because all the reds are once again potable, and here's Ross McInnes. Does that red squeeze in between the two yellows here? Yes, it does. Running on a little harder than he wanted to. Yes, he wanted that one down the cushion into the bottom left, but now forced to double it into the bottom right. And again, he won't be wildly excited about that shot. Well, not only missing it, Chris, he's left the red in the worst possible position. It's on the bottom cushion. So Charlie Nolan can now afford to go for the finish, knowing that if he does fall down and miss, he will not be leaving too much for Ross McInnes. Well, Ross may elect to double the red in off the yellow into the top left-hand corner pocket. Well, obviously, he couldn't see enough of it, so he came off the bottom cushion first. And it certainly seems the pace of this table is catching both of these very experienced players out at the moment, Steve. Yes, it's a very fast table, and uh, I'm sure they'll uh, make allowances for that after this first frame. Well, a brave effort that uh, failed to come off, and uh, every time that Charlie Noll comes back to the table, you have the feeling that he's going to put some uh, fiendish little snooker for McInnes to work his way out of. Well, in fact, he can play the one on the top cushion now and leave McInnes snooker behind the two yellows in the middle of the table. Again, Ross has been unlucky there. He's hit the red, but it's landed on the bottom cushion again, so Charlie quite comfortable again. Well, he can gently stun the yellow into the centre pocket, leaving the next yellow into the bottom left. He's run up the table with the cue ball, so he's playing the one to the top left first. And that was a bad shot. He wanted the cue ball to be a lot closer to that yellow than it is. So it's got to be the bottom right. <laughs> well, a fine shot, but uh, not an easy black to finish the game. But easy enough for Charles Nolan, and he wins the opening frame to go one frame to nil into the lead. Second frame, Charlie Nolan break. <coughs> and his confidence boosted by victory in the opening frame. Charles Nolan breaks a nice wide open pack, and two reds have gone and one yellow. So the choice of colours. Nominate, please. Well, he's got the choice, as you say, Chris, and they're all very open. Just the five reds, the six yellows. Well, he's elected the Reds. Oh. 
He'll be playing the one into the bottom right next. Meant the cue ball to travel a little bit further than that for the red into the bottom left. Must be careful with this shot, the cue ball cannoning onto the black. looking on playing the red into the top left here and stunning the cue ball towards the side cushion on the right hand side for the next red by the black well he's going back to his original plan here A lot of players tend to cramp up when they play on television. Do you respond to the, the bright lights? Yes, uh, I like playing in front of a, an audience, especially if an audience uh, doesn't like me. Uh, if an audience likes me and wants me to win, it's not the same. I just take the sit back. But if they really hate me, then, then I, I, I try a lot harder. So you've come down here for the first time and, and you're pretty confident of going away with the title, are you? Well, hopefully. Uh, there, are, there are seven top-class players. Uh, the one amateur boy that came through, I've never really seen them play, but they're six top professionals. Give them their due. I may slag them all the time, but they are top professionals. Mm -hmm. I think you might brighten things up down here a bit. Yes, hopefully. Good to have you down here. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Very nice shot. So black into the top right now for a lovely clearance. has levelled it up, he's come back and that is now one frame apiece and Ross McInnes looks a very happy man. Third frame, Ross McInnes to break. Well all the fears we had that Charlie Nolan would tighten up this game have proved false so far and Ross McInnes makes a wide nominated. open break in this third frame. One frame apiece at the moment. Well, the red has gone down from the break, so he's playing reds. And that really is about the only red he can go for. Well, with the four reds of Ross McInnes towards the left-hand corner of the table, it might be a good idea for Charles Nolan to block that bottom left-hand corner pocket. Tried for the block, and you can see from that smile that uh, he's amused by the fact it didn't uh, stay there. And this is the patience of a man who's waited hours in his time for the number 14 bus to arrive. The red passes the yellow into the bottom right. She's got a possibility of going for the uh, finish here. He's forced now to play the red into the bottom left and come round of two cushions. With the cue ball back up towards the black. Well, only an eight foot table, but uh, Ross McInnes are requiring the rest just to make sure. The problem for Ross here is he must avoid making contact with the yellow by the bottom cushion there. He's got to stun past it and hit the bottom cushion, side cushion and back up towards the black. Very nice shot there from Ross. And now has the choice of either the middle pocket or the red on the left hand side in the middle of the table. Oh, 
Well, look. suddenly the world doesn't look quite so rosy to Ross McInnes, Steve. No, it was not a very good positional shot there from Ross. He's uh, left in no, no man's land. He's going for the fine cut, I think, to the bottom right. A brilliant shot, That's but very unfortunate to put the cue ball. Two visits. Three table. And once again, as we look in slow motion, we'll see this terrific fine cut from Ross McInnes into the bottom right, catching the yellow and the cue ball just dropping into the centre pocket. Very, very unfortunate. Second visit. uses those two shots to consolidate his position and to put Ross <laughs> under some pressure. That's a foul. Two visits. And that Free table. rather basic mistake there, Steve, could have cost Ross this frame. Yes, he should have uh, hit that red. It wasn't uh, a very difficult snooker from Charlie, but they are missable and... Uh, Here's Charlie now to see if he can clear up from this position. All the yellows are nicely possible. He's got two shots. Yellow into the bottom left here, sending the cue ball up towards the yellow over the top left. Has the choice now to stun the cue ball into the other one. Well, he's hit it a little bit too hard. He's caught the yellow a little bit full on and it's gone behind the red. He's still got two shots. Visit. Not a very kind double kiss for Charlie Nolan. He can double this across the table or go for the fine cut into the right hand centre pocket. And then it goes, leaving him with the black to go for to go back ahead. Certainly potable, but not an easy shot. So Ross McInnes returns to the table, and I'm sure just a few seconds ago he didn't think he would. Well, whichever ready goes for, it's a pressure shot with that black hanging over the pocket. Well, a brave effort from the Scotsman, but that lets Dublin-born Charles Nolan back to the table for, for the simplest of black. No mistake this time. Down it goes. And that means that Charles Nolan now leads by two frames to one. And waiting for the winner of this quarter-final is last week's winner, Steve Sanders, in the centre of the picture there. As we join the next frame, McInnes has yet to pot a yellow, but they look invitingly well spread. on the left-hand side cushion is just a problem at the moment. He may try to screw back onto that one now. Well, that's heading for the middle pocket. Down it goes. It's a foul. <laughs> and uh, sad luck for Ross McInnes. And it really would be ironic if uh, at this stage of the game it's Ross McInnes who starts to play a tactical game. His, his open attacking style has not uh, paid off so far. 
Chanley Nolan heading for a three frames to one win. This one's got to be slow and gentle. Second visit. Played that one nicely. You just uh, gently roll this one into the pocket and then the black. Well, by Charles Nolan's standards, this is an absolute gallop. And down that goes at that final black, and Charles Nolan now leads by three frames to one. Fifth frame, Ross McInnes to break. And Ross McInnes has a lot to think about and a lot to worry about at the moment. A confident young man at the very best of times. Ross believed that he was going to go all the way to the final. Well, the reds dropping down. Three reds have gone down from the break. Red ball nominated. And one yellow, of course, but red he's red nominated red the red reds. Young, clearly at first. Good choice. Well, obviously, he didn't okay, nominate, you. but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Red Bull's nominated. He has now. He's nominated the Reds. Playing the plants here. Oh, quite a long way out with that one. Not a very good shot there from Charles Nolan. He had the opportunity to win the frame from there, but swung back in Ross's favour now. And that, on the other hand, was a nice plant from Ross McInnes. Along the cushions, the bottom right here. Tried to force the cue ball off the side cushion and down for the next red, and because of that reason, missed the pot. It was a power shot. And not a happy little Scotsman there. Speaking to him before tonight's match, he told me he was not playing very well. And he's made quite a few mistakes in this match so far to verify that statement. And again, the pace, and he looks as if he's going to roll in the top pocket. Very lucky indeed. <laughs> but Ross can still smile about it. Very fortunate for Ross McInnes there in the fact that Charlie Nolan cannot see either of the two yellows over the top right-hand corner pocket because of the knuckle. There are occasions when Charlie Nolan actually chews that you know that he is alive. A man who will not rush his shots stands there and thinks about it. He's looking to roll the yellow down the side cushion to the bottom right. Well, he's left it reasonably safe. There's a chance of the double here for Ross McKinnis into the left-hand centre pocket. Well, he's gone for the fine cut. It's a very good shot. A little unfortunate with the lie of the final red. Yes, that was really unlucky for Ross there. He had the golden opportunity to take the frame, but now must just leave it over the pocket. He's gone for the double. Oh, a fine shot. 
very nice shot. I didn't think that one would pass the two yellows into the bottom right, but obviously it did, and now does the black pass. Well, Ross is shaking his head. It's got to be extremely tight. Well, he did rather rush that one a bit, Chris, didn't he? Yes, he did, but uh, he lives to fight another day, maybe. No foul shot at the moment. I think we'll be seeing uh, Charles Nolan just rolling the yellow into the top right and then sending the cue ball behind the yellow next to it for a tight snooker. He does not want to go for game with that black on the side cushion. He needs the two. McInnes coming off the side cushion. Oh dear, hits the black but also hits the yellow and gives away the two Here shots. And things are looking very tough indeed for Ross McInnes. Charlie Nolan appears to be heading for a place in the semi-final. If that one goes, he's home and drive, but it hasn't, so it's uh, just the one shot remaining now. They're all quite simple, but Charlie oh, may elect to tuck him behind that yellow again. Cushions here. It's a foul. Well, yet Can another foul shot. Peter. And you can see from the look on his face that Ross McInnes is not a happy man. Running the cue ball down towards the final yellow into the bottom right. Still two shots. This looks fairly simple to me. And he'll just be jabbing this one in and screwing the cue ball back. Roughly where it is now for the black into the bottom left. There it is. the fifth frame and puts Charles Nolan into a four frame to one lead and things are looking very difficult indeed for Ross McInnes. Well, it really is beginning to look as though we have a major upset in prospect here at Dartford in this quarter-final of the London Championship. We've already seen Charles Nolan, the London bus inspector, take a 4-1 lead against the flying Scotsman, as they call him, Ross McInnes. Now, as we pick it up in the seventh, Nolan only needs one more frame to put McInnes out of the competition. For McInnes, survival means going for the six reds still left on the table. Brilliant pot under pressure from Ross McInnes. He's got to pot all of these reds and get on the black because wherever he leaves the cue ball, Charlie Nolan has two simple ones, both over pockets. He's run slowly out of position, so he's forced to play the easy ones. The centre left hand corner, left hand pocket here. Working out the running order. McKinnis cannot afford any mistake. Well, that was an attempt to move the black. He was very unfortunate, and look where the cue ball stayed, right on the bottom cushion, making the next pot very, very difficult for Ross McKinnis. He's got to go for it. Well, we've talked before about McInnes playing well under pressure, and you can't get more pressure than he's got at the moment.
And the black is, of course, the major problem for McInnes. Putting the two reds away for a player of his ability, not too difficult. And that mistake looks like having pushed Ross McInnes out of this quarter-final. It's cost him a place in the semi-final. Well, Charlie Nolan just looking to see which yellow to pop first. And the one he should take is the one by the black. That's the one he's playing now. Oh, that's very, very nice for Ross McInnes. The black being sent towards the bottom left-hand corner pocket where the red is over the pocket. Uh, um, and he's snooking himself, and Ross McInnes was bounding out of his seat so fast to have a look at the action on the table. Yes, that really, really was a bad shot from Charlie Nolan. He'll be kicking himself now. He's got to put a little bit of right-hand side on the cue ball to bend slightly around the red. He's trying to bend around the red here. Foul. The white Good goes down. And maybe Three Ross people. McInnes has been thrown a lifeline. Ross McInnes back in the hunt. Eighth frame, <laughs> Charles Nolan to break. Charles Nolan again needing just one frame to clinch that semi final spot. Open table. Charlie Nolan's got to put that last frame right out of his mind straight away because he knew he had the match one and blew it. Open table. <laughs> Playing one yellow onto the other, hoping the second yellow will stay in the pocket, and we've played that one with perfect yellow pace. Nominated. Maybe looking now to roll the next yellow down to block the bottom left-hand corner pocket. That one's fell in, so he may be now looking to block the bottom right. And surprisingly, the pace of the table still catching these two men out. Well, in fact, that time he did go for the pot. And decided to block it that time instead. There certainly doesn't appear to be a great deal left on the table for Ross McInnes. <coughs> but McInnes, several times so far, has pulled something out of nothing. <coughs> we can pop to the yellow over the bottom left-hand corner pocket if he wishes. Charlie Nolan's got a possibility of going for the frame here. The yellow will pass the black into the bottom left. Stunning the cue ball here for the next yellow by the bottom cushion. Very good shots. If this one goes, and the black will pass those two reds into the bottom right, is it possible that you could win the match on this break? And moved one of the reds away from the black. Well, obviously the black would not go, Chris, so he's moved the black. Now, can he get past the black to pot the yellow? Well, obviously he can. Oh, it's a very hard, block, hard black here. He's got to go into the bottom left-hand corner pocket 
and the cue ball will be travelling close to the bottom right, so he's got to be careful here. Well, he's putting bottom on the cue ball to avoid the enough. And we're left in a classic situation with seven reds on the table and Charles Nolan just needing to put the black away. And now we see McGuinness almost certainly going to put Nolan under some snooker pressure. Yes, he says it's my turn now, Charles. <laughs> Little bow from Ross McGuinness. <laughs> well, considering his uh, five frames to two down, Ross McGuinness now beginning to enjoy this competition. He's playing with left-hand side off one side cushion. Too much left-hand side, in fact. Two shots for Ross McInnes. Two visits, free table. Although Ross is 5-2 down, I expect him to clear the table from this position. Oh, and that's a very bad shot to start Second with. Second visit. Well, maybe uh, we'll have a situation where he'll... Uh, put it down as many as he wants to and then put uh, Charlie under a snooker situation again, Steve. Yes, that may be the possibility, but I think he's still going for the frame here. It's OK uh, messing about with the crowd and that, but he's got to concentrate on potting these balls. He's 5-2 down, he can't afford a mistake. The nickname Flying Scotsman, well deserved at the moment. Storming round the table. This is the crucial shot. He's got to get good position on the black. And that's that's not too bad. The black will pot quite easily into the centre right pocket. And down indeed it goes. And the Ross McInnes has come back yet again. He now trails five frames to three. And McInnes isn't out of it yet. Ninth frame, Ross McInnes to break. <laughs> Ross McInnes makes the break. And again, a wide open break, but nothing drops in. Open table. And red, perhaps, is the better of the two. Charlie Nolan agrees with me. Red Bulls nominated. Well, he's got the bottom left-hand corner pocket blocked, so he attempts to block the bottom right and get command of the bottom end of the table completely. Ross McInnes, a pensions officer with British Steel, I'm sure would like to pension Charlie Nolan off in this one. But he's got an awful lot to do before he can do that. Don't like this sort of match, does uh, Ross McInnes, having to roll his balls up to Charlie Owens, but he's forced to, having been 5-3 down, can't afford to lose his frame. Three out of four corner pockets blocked now with the reds. And this one turned out to be a tactical frame from start. He'll just be rolling this red a little closer towards the pocket here. in the black onto the side cushion there with that shot, a very nice one. <coughs> it's going 
close to the top pocket. And there he goes, and uh, Charles Nolan has given that frame away. The black goes down, attempting to move it off the cushion, and Ross McInnes moves back into the contest again. He trails now five frames to four. Trust Card is a credit card welcomed throughout the world. Trust Card for payments and credit wherever you see the visa sign. Trust Card is backed by TSB. But whoever you bank with, Trust Card, it's all you need. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him. Oh, no. <laughs> My noble Lord Hamlet. Over here, son. On me head. I bet he drinks Carling Black Label. Your best bet for a fuller flavour. Carling Black Label. Oh, Montego. Holidays for the kids. Caribbean holidays. Have you been busy, Sean? Did you know? Are you going with a brand new Montego? Could this be it? Bought you for little. A twenty-five thousand pounds. Caribbean holiday. Yes, holidays at our own go, and that's a money prize to win. So get along me now and don't be slow. Fanciest winning the new Montego. I wonder who won. Don't mention the Caribbean holiday. At your BP station. Oh, no. You can win a brand new Montego. BP Treasure Trove. Collect your game chart and card at a BP station. Welcome back to the John Bull Bitter London Pool Championship. And if Scotsman Ross McInnes does win this quarter-final against the London bus inspector Charles Nolan, it really will be one of the great comeback stories. He's been on the brink of defeat for the last three frames. Now he's clawed his way back to only 5-4 down. As we rejoin Steve Clark and Chris Carter, Nolan still only needs one more frame to go through. And those okay. yellows look fairly open to me. Yes, they certainly are, Chris. It's just the yellow on the right-hand side cushion. It will not pot because of the red, so Ross may elect to move that red now, which he does. Yellow ball nominated. Maybe forced to play the long one into the top left here. And McKinney's fairly bouncing round the table. He's getting back into form. <coughs> and I'm sure he can sense that perhaps this is a game that he can win. He's overhit that one. He wanted the yellow into the bottom right next. Going for the double here. Oh, very unfortunate. Now, had that gone, he had a great chance to finish. But now all is not lost. Now it's swung back in the favour of Charlie Nolan here. All the reds are potable. He's got good snooker possibilities up the top right-hand corner of the table here as well. And I'm sure Charles Nolan can't really believe this. He was at one stage five frames to one in the lead, apparently <laughs> coasting to a place in the semi final. And now he's having to work very hard indeed. Yes, well, he's got himself to blame for that one, Chris, with that drastic mistake in the seventh frame when he could have clinched the match six frames to one. <coughs> oh, 
Well, with that yellow stain over the bottom right, it's given China something to think about here. And he'll be looking for a snooker from this position. Off the jaw of the corner pocket, up behind the red. <laughs> That's a tight one, that one. It's uh, <coughs> crucial that Ross McInnes does escape the snooker. Well, it's a good one. Played for the one by the black, but missed that one and rolled up and hit the one by the centre pocket. He'll be pleased with that little bit of luck. Just the red down by the bottom right-hand corner pocket, causing the problems for Charlie Nolan here. The one on the left-hand side, cushioned by his Q-tip now, is not too much of a problem, because he can just roll that one down, and it's forced to knock the one in that's over the pocket. Not a man to be hurried. if he can see the one over the bottom right hand corner pocket I'm sure we'll go for the frame here the one in the centre pocket to follow this one well, that's not come out too nicely he's got the wrong angle on the one in the centre pocket so he's got to go up the table and back down for the next one into the bottom right and that's worked out beautifully Got to get the other side of the black, so he may have to go up the table and back down again. Oh, and he's made oh. a disastrous mistake. Two visits, free table. And I've said it before, but that could easily be the mistake that has cost Ross McInnes a place in the semi final. And once again, we have the opportunity to watch in slow motion what could be the final mistake in this tournament by Ross McInnes. He's got to get the cue ball up and down the table for the black, digs in too deep, and it curves into the top left-hand corner pocket. Well, this is very simple. Roll this one down the cushion. And there, just behind Ross McInnes, is the man who was beaten in last week's uh, quarter-final, Rob McKenna. Well, this looks very simple now. Still two shots, the one into the bottom right first. And scoring back to the one into the top right. May I elect just to roll this one in so that it stays out of the pocket if he does miss. Still two on the black now. Black into the bottom left. Second visit. And Charlie Nolan, the London Transport bus inspector, <laughs> pretending that he's got nerves and he hasn't because he's six that one. No problems at all. He's through to the semi final. He's won this one six frames to four. And now to Jim Rosenthal, it down the, in the centre of the arena. Thanks so much indeed, Chris. Well, that really is a very big upset here. Let's uh, just call Big Charlie in and have a have a word with him. Come on in here, Charlie. Now you told us beforehand that it was like the the first division against the fourth. Have you surprised yourself a little bit here? Of course I have, yeah. But uh, of course Ross has been taking lessons from uh, the Cockney, the crafty Cockney, I think, before he came here. Yeah. 
the, the things he said about you beforehand, I mean, do they G you up a little bit? Not really, no. Help me study a bit more. Although I wasn't slow tonight, I really surprised myself how fast I went. Mind you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he surprised us a bit as well, I must yeah. say. Yeah. Mind you, he came back terrifically well, didn't he? I mean, did you think at one stage that he might nick it from you? No, it wasn't that he came back well. It's just like I kept giving him the game to me. But uh, as I say, I was well pleased tonight. Mm -hmm. Russell, a really good player. Very fast. You really have to keep on top of him. And what now for you for the rest of the tournament? Oh, well, another strong player, Steve, who beat me last year, of course. I was leading 5 3, so I've got revenge to come in there as well, I suppose. Very well done tonight, a great performance. Thanks, Smashy. <laughs> And that uh, really is deserved applause, that, for Charlie. And as he said, he goes through to the semi-final. He's going to play Steve. That's Haynaught Steve Sanders. That'll be in three weeks' time. But next Friday night here on Shoot Pool, we'll be welcoming England's number one. That's big Dave Dolman. Many people think he could go all the way here. And Dave Dolman up against Mick Casey, 20-year-old Irishman from Halsden. And Mick has been working really hard at his game and tends to produce his best against the top name. So, till next Friday, same time, same place, from all of us in Dartford, a very good night. Once or twice he said to me, I can't go on, I can't do it alone, you must help me. And I said, of course, the strength of two is sometimes needed where strength of one is not enough. Whether or not she knew she had an inherent uh, disease that would end in madness and told him, I don't know, if she did and said, you'll never give me up to a mental asylum or anything like that, will you promise? He would promise and he would die at the stake before he would break a promise. And possibly that had happened. Because some of her letters after his death ended for keeps, keeper, for keeps, you see? She called him keeper. That was interesting. The pressures of caring for Beryl put a great strain on Arthur, but when he was able to get away from the home that had become a virtual prison, he and Alison escaped to secret places around Bloomsbury. The gallery of the Courtauld Institute was a favourite rendezvous. We were always looking for sanctuaries where our difficulties wouldn't pursue. Beryl was getting very old and more and more ill and difficult. It was an exhausting job for both of us. At certain times of the day, I would know whether he was here or there, and he would know the same of me. He so, so needed to get away from it all, even just for an hour. And the serenity of this place, of course, was wonderful, the pictures themselves. Alison captured Arthur's state of mind in this drawing. It's a picture of his state of anguish, if you like, but I couldn't get this expression of despair out of my eyes, and I had always to draw things or write them or get them outside of myself to make them endurable. And so, yes, I did. I drew a picture of him in that desperate state. And, of course, later, when I drew him after his death, he looked 20 years younger. The serenity, the beauty had come back. Today, Alison is celebrating the spirit of her husband. To mark the 20th anniversary of Arthur's death, she's preparing a radio anthology of his work with the actor John Watts and producer Piers Plowright. Mm. John, how are you? Okay. Busy? Yes, quite busy. We will be in a minute. Come on, shall we go upstairs? The first thing I've got to tell you is that yesterday Radio 4 agreed to a 30-minute programme called provisionally A Garland for Arthur. Is the programme going to centre on Arthur? That's the idea, that, that, that it's a programme in celebration. Yes, it's prose and poetry and everything about Arthur. And his it? own writings, his own original Oh, yes, writing. some original things worked in, yes. 
The days of my youth left me long ago, and now in their turn dwindle my years of prime. With what thoughts of sadness and loneliness I walk again in this cold, deserted place. In the midst of the garden long I stand alone, the sunshine faint, the wind and dew chill. In 1962, the at the flat in Gordon Square, Beryl was dying. Alison and Arthur were with her during her last hours. And she smiled, a toothless, terrifying, but a very warm smile. And she was quite still, not grotesque anymore, because all the time she was writhing, you see. And this, suddenly she was calm still. And I went down to Arthur and he said, what happened? And I said, well, she wants to see you now. She rang the bell again. He went up and exactly the same thing happened, he told me when he came down. He said, she made me kneel down, take her two hands. And she looked at me and she, she wasn't mad a bit. She wasn't mad at all. She, and she said, Alison's nice. And I said, oh, what a wonderful word. What a banal but wonderful word. So we've all made peace, the one with the other. Everything is resolved. After 33 years of their extraordinary love affair, Alison and Arthur were finally able to live together. They moved to the narrow house in Highgate. Although Arthur was 72 and Alison 60, there seemed to be many years of happiness ahead. Then, one day, quite unexpectedly, Arthur asked Alison to marry him. Arthur was tremendously happy. He had done the thing he had wanted to do for so long. But why he felt necessary to rectify matters and make an honest woman of me sort of thing, I couldn't understand because I was very convinced, unconventional, didn't mind one way or the other. But even as they were being married, Arthur was dying. Arthur's gaze is fixed on the brightly moving sky, but returns slowly, lifts to the wide sweep of the roses. Wonderful, he says. It is the 27th of June. We have been married a month and a day. Chinese food and most of all prawns and very hot with chilies because Alison likes extremes. You probably know. And egg noodles and sticky rice in leaves and those funny little dumplings that the Chinese eat. Theatrically, do you see, I have to be still behind those wretched footlights. I've got to go on living a part called life. But I feel he's in the wings as a sort of prompt. And if I'm in any doubt, he'll mutter the right line and I'll, I'll succeed. Well, it's the way you put them when you finish your meal. If you put them this way, it means I'd like to s sleep with your wife. And your hosts put them a different way, it means OK by me. <laughs> At a dinner party, Alison displays her gift for anecdote and conversation. Above all, her sheer zest for life. When people say, who brought you up, I say, my father did. But he died when you were six. Yes, that is why. Because I incised on my retina everything that had happened. Do you believe in fate? Do you believe in kismet? Do you believe in destiny? Rather. I give myself over. Was it all meant to be? Everything. That was terrible, the drenched dress and the, the, the hot air vent. Well, I don't mind being pushed around by whatever forces there are beyond my knowledge because my knowledge is very limited. So is yours, incidentally. So is everybody's. But they hate most. Philosophers and scientists can't bear to admit that they don't know everything. 
Isn't it strange how rewarding tortoise can be? She, he? She, she, she. Well, I don't know. I keep feeding the wrong end.